All right, everyone, welcome to uh, this webinar held by Seagray Canada NGN. Um, my name is Kasim Samarasekra. Um, I'm currently a senior power system engineer at Electric Power Engineers. I'm also the NGN technical lead for the Seagray Canada NGN uh, committee. So before we start, um, I'd just like to, you know, give a brief explanation of what the next generation network is. So the NGN is the next generation network and our goal is to help bring the new generation of power system professionals, so the young you know, professionals into the world of Seagray to help them deliver a platform, to have a platform early in their career so they can you know, get comfortable sharing their ideas. Um, the main goal is to support the next generation of Canadian power system professionals, but pro providing them with opportunities for technical growth, networking and leadership skills for students and young members. So there are various ways to get involved in Seagray, such as joining a working group, writing a paper, uh, attending Seagray events such as conferences and symposiums. And we also have various uh, kind of initiatives to encourage, you know, young members and students to join Seagray and get involved. So we have this Seagray Paris sponsorship, which is held biannually by Seagray Canada NGN. Um, so you could be a student or a young member and basically uh, the winner gets awarded um, uh, basically uh, compensation to go travel to Seagray Paris and attend the conference there. And in order to win this award, you have to basically show how uh, how well you've contributed to Seagray, whether that's, you know, writing papers or, you know, attending conferences or, you know, doing webinars like Moat is currently doing. So this is great. Um, we also have Young Members Best Paper Award and Student Paper Awards that, you know, it's a thousand dollar cash prize um, held at each year at the Seagray Canada Conference. So, yeah, that's kind of a brief overview of what we do. Um, so if you have any questions on that, feel free to contact uh, me or email me. But without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, introduce our guest speaker today. So Moat Faraj, um, he'll be doing uh, this technical webinar series on cooperative grid forming control strategies for PV and battery energy storage system for an isolated microgrid. So a very exciting topic. So I'll just go over his bio here just to introduce um, him to everyone. So Mo Moat Faraj uh, received his Bachelor of Science degree in the electrical engineering at, from Philadelphia University, Jordan in 2019. He recently completed his master's at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, and is currently working as a HVDC and power system studies engineer at Hatch. In his master's, he worked on developing a power management system for an isolated microgrid and with the help of hardware in the loop simulation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Moak, uh, who will start his webinar. Uh, please give him a uh, Warm welcome. Let's see. I think we can do this sort of stuff here. Thank okay. you for the introduction. I will go share ahead. my screen and go over my presentation. So welcome to my presentation. I'm Moad Faraj. Uh, this research was done with the help of the PhD student Roshani Kalufan Traj uh, and the professor Athula Rajabakshi in the University of Manitoba. My topic is about cooperative grid forming control strategy for PV and battery energy storage systems in an isolated microgrid. I will start with my outline. I will start with talking about the background and motivation of this research and the objectives. Then we'll jump to the test system setup, PV grid feeding control. Then we'll talk about the PV battery joint grid forming control. Then we'll talk how, about the PV array controller, which is the boost. Then we'll end with some results and discussions. Many communities and off-grid power systems in Northern Canada lack here around transportation, and they rely on winter roads that are over lakes like this for the transportation of fuel, for fuel and goods. Such communities primarily rely on diesel generation for electricity. However, Transportation and storing diesel, diesel can pose hazards and emissions and spills can happen, which are very costly to clean. Therefore, the utilization of a local renewable energy resor resources, 
such as PV, can reduce the reliance on the diesel generation. PV diesel energy system has, has emerged as a one potential solution. Here in this picture, we are showing a PV system installed in Northern Canada. When you have a PV system along with the diesel generators, the diesel generators might operate at an undesirable output, as we can see here, which ultimately can result in a low efficiency and loss of life. PV power curtailment is also may needed to accommodate the minimum loading of diesel generators, which is going to make the investment in a PV is unattractive, as we can see here. So, installing uh, a battery energy storage system along with the PV and diesel and with a proper energy management system can improve this situation. PV diesel battery topology is emerging as a reliable and cost effective solution to remove a grid power system. Energy management system of PV diesel battery can optimize the overall operation over a longer time horizon, such as 24 hours which is going to minimize the operating cost, emissions, and components degrade degradation. Also will maximize the utilization of renewable resources, such as PV. During energy excess period, it can be noted that it, it's economical to meet the demand solely using a VEC interface PV and battery units, for which case the battery is going to be forming the grid. Therefore, the capability of the PV unit to function under different operating modes, such as grid feeding and grid forming, would strengthen the control redundancy under such operating conditions. The objective of this research is to enhance the PV unit controls under grid feeding and grid forming modes in an isolated hybrid PV battery configuration. A specific objectives can include investigate the capability of the PV unit to operate in different operating modes as a grid feeding source and developing an adaptive joint grid forming strategy for the PV and battery units while controlling and maximizing the available solar power. This is my test system setup. It's an isolated microgrid that has a battery energy storage system and a PV. The battery energy storage system is interfaced through a buck boost converter that mainly is going to regulate the DC link voltage while facilitating a bidirectional power flow. A VEC that's going to operate in a grid forming mode, an LCL filter which is going to mitigate the harmonics. Where we, where we have the, P, the PV here is interfaced through a boost converter that is going to control the DC link voltage or uh, or or the or maximize or control the PV power. A VEC is that has two different operating modes, a grid feeding and a grid supporting, in which for a grid supporting, a droop mode is going to be applied, uh, going to be applied in order to form the grid along with the battery energy storage system. This is the battery energy storage system control strategy. If the PV VEC is operating in a grid supporting mode, then there is a droop control that will generate the V reference and the frequency reference for the D and the Q axis after voltage control loops. Whereas if we are operating in a grid feeding control, we will operate at the nominal voltage and the frequency. This grid forming is going to generate the ID reference and IQ reference for the D and the Q axis current conventional controller. This is the battery energy storage after voltage control loops. Looking Looking here by giving VQ0, the voltage vector is going to be oriented with the D axis. Therefore, the regulation of VD is going to be adequate in controlling the AC voltage magnitude. The incorporation of the C of omega VQ and C of omega VD is going to reduce the coupling on the outer voltage uh, control loops. Also, the D and the Q axis current of the grid is incorporated to reduce the effect of load dynamics on the voltage control tasks. Since this is an isolated microgrid, the frequency is going to be controlled in an, an, an open loop manner using an oscillator at a fixed frequency. The, the oscillator diagram is going to look like this. When we operate the PV in a grid feeding control, 
The battery in such case is mainly responsible of forming the voltage and the frequency for the PV VEC. In such conditions, the PV will operate at MPPT most of the time as a grid feeding inverter. And this is the PV outer power control loop. The D axis is going to be mainly responsible of regulating the DC link voltage of the PV VECs by balancing the power in and power out operation, whereas the the Q axis is going to mainly responsible of regulating the reactive power of, of the of the PV VSC. When here and here we are, I'm going to introduce the PV battery joint grid forming control. In such case, the PV operates in a grid in a grid supporting mode. Uh, that's going to form the grid along with the battery energy storage system in a in a multi in a multi master configuration governed by group control and since is since this is a low voltage microgrid we are pv and q omega q omega group curves are going to be applied looking at here this is the pv group curve pv group curve d and the q axis similar outer voltage control loops are going to be used for as used in the battery energy storage system where here the VD reference is going to be derived by the PV group curve. And on top of that, we can see that there is a secondary controller in order to restore the nominal voltage, restore the nominal voltage of the grid. However, when we operate a PV VSC in a droop in a droop mode, it would be inefficient as the main as the main concern is to harness the maximum available power. Therefore, there are two different modes to derive the set point of the PV. These two different modes are reserve mode, such that the PV will operate near MPPT with an adequate reserve, and reserve and then this reserve is going to facilitate forming the voltage and the frequency, which is very crucial when you operate a PV VEC in a grid forming. Looking at the reserve mode control diagram. We can see that the power set point is derived by uh, the VMPPT and the VVPV that is multiplied by a coefficient which is always should be higher than one. It's higher than one because in reserve we need to operate the PV array between the MPPT point and the open circuit voltage point. Where sometimes the other mode is load following, sometimes uh, the, the battery energy storage system will reach the S2C maximum limit due to sustained period of high power. Therefore, the PV will start tracking the load by providing this as a power reference. And that 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 will push the battery into idle state. And the and the the control is going to switch between two these two different modes depending on the S2C and if the PV power is higher than the PV load. Similar oscillator control structure is used here, but a Q, a Q omega positive droop curve is utilized because we have a resistive microgrid. And on top of that, we can see that we have a secondary controller here to restore the nominal, uh, nominal value of the frequency. Here I'm going to introduce the PV array controller, which is the boost based on the control strategy. We have the PV uh, the PV boost controlling approach is going to be varied. There are three different techniques, which are MPPT, MPPT mode, in which that the PV array will operate at uh, the MPPT voltage in order to harness the maximum available solar power. Limited power mode, which is going to be utilized when the when the battery energy storage system reaches its SUC maximum during because of uh, because due like due to sustained period of high PV power and this supervisory power reference is is, is gonna is gonna be supplied by the supervisory control in order to push the battery into idle state or discharge at a very low power this is when we operate the PV in a grid for feeding control but when we operate the PV in a grid supporting grid forming mode then the boost array is going the boost uh, the boost controller is going to be mainly res responsible of regulating the dc link voltage as we can see here 
Experiments here were conducted on a real-time simulation environment, RTDS. Here we have a scenario where we operate the PV in a grid feeding control and the battery operates in a grid forming. At the start, we can see here that the battery is providing the required slack power and the PV is following the MPPT reference. Following irradiance, uh, irradiance change and load change, we can see that the, the, the battery is providing the required slack power and the PV follows its MPPT reference. Also, if you look, if we, if we are looking at the reactive power, we can see that the PV is operating at a unity power factor and the battery provides a required reactive power. The AC voltage frequency and the DC link voltage of the PV show a, sta show a stable response. Here we have PV grid feeding control. Here at the start, we can see that, that the battery is uh, providing the required slack power. And here, following, following the irradiant change from 200 to 800, the, BB, the PV follows its MPPT reference. Clo close, close to 20 seconds, the supervisor controls anticipates an overcharge and provides the PV array with a, with a supervisory power reference. And the PV here starts following its, uh, its, its limited, it starts following its limited power mode reference. If we looked at the PV voltage and the MPPT, we can see that the PV array voltage is higher than the MPPT, which is uh, which is a curtailment mode. Uh, close to here, as the irradiance drops from 800 to 300, we can see that the uh, PV array exits limited power mode and starts following the MPPT reference, as, we, as also reflected here. Here we have a results for a joint grid forming mode. Uh, at the start, we can see that the battery energy storage system provides the required sl sl slack power following a load change and irradiance, an irradiance range from 500 to 1000. Close to, 20, close to 25 seconds, the battery energy storage system here trips and the PV here in response, the PV here is going to take over the grid forming task and starts providing the required uh, power, power and uh, required active and reactive power generation. Prior to this, to the battery energy storage trip, we can see from the reactive power that the PV and the battery are provide are, are sharing the reactive power burden as the as as the battery trips. The PV takes over and starts, it starts providing the required reactive power. The AC voltage frequency and the DC link voltage of the PV shows also a stable response. Here we have the results for the load following mode when we have the joint grid forming. As the start here, we can see that the battery is charging and as it treats SOC 90%, which is said to be the SOC max, the PV will enter a load, fo load following mode and start tracking the load in order to push the battery into idle state. Following a load increase here, still the PV managed to increase to increase its uh, power to keep the battery into idle into idle state. As the load here increases more than what the PV can provide, the PV will exit the uh, load following mode and starts track starts. Uh, starts following its MPPT reference. And if you looked at the SOC here, the battery starts charging. Both PV grid feeding and grid forming controls are investigated under load changes, solar radiance changes, power containment moods, and component failures. The results also confirm the capability of the PV unit to operate under grid feeding and grid forming controls while maximizing the penetration of the freely available solar power. This work was supported by the University of Manitoba, Research Manitoba, and Solar Solution. Thank you. Any questions?
Thanks, Malat, for um, this uh, great presentation. Very interesting. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to write it in the chat or you know raise your hand. I think we can unmute you. Uh, let me see if I can unmute everyone here. Allow mics for attendees. So I think you should be able to talk now, and I will also allow your camera if you want to show your face and ask the question. Um, or you could just write in the chat and we can uh, convey that question to So we have a question from Scott Henderson. How did you model the response time of the battery and or the inertia of the diesel gen sets? The, res the response time of the battery was tuned actually by tuning the D and the Q, by tuning both the outer voltage control loops, which is, which are you? So we like in order to respond like for the battery response time, we you have to tune this PI control and this PI control properly, along with tuning the inner volt the inner current voltage control loops, which is in a D and Q axis. For the diesel inertia, uh, we got that from like because this this system is implemented on site and we got the data from the uh, solar solution. I have, I have a question, Moax. So yeah, um, if while the battery is in grid forming mode, so the solar would be in grid following, right? Um, yeah. In this case, what happens if, you know, the battery uh, loses its state of charge and it goes to zero? It, does it have a, a way to, oh, you know? The way we do it is that if it loses its state of charge, because we have a an energy management system for that. And if that such a case happens, we are going to go into load shedding and this interruptible loads and priority loads are going to be shed and we are going to only live with the critical loads. So we will anticipate beforehand that, OK, the battery is going to go into under and uh, into under charging mode. So we will shed that beforehand. OK, you'll curtail it, but like what happens if um, so that's that's assuming that the battery has some state of charge, but what happens if there's, you know, no sun and the battery is at zero, so you just have to shut down the loads then at that point? Or would... Oh, in such case, you will have the diesel generation. Like okay, this... diesel will kick in. Okay. Yeah, we have a diesel generation. We have two diesel generators, but I did not include them in this presentation. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? Yeah, I have one. Uh, I just typed it in the chat. How big is the site that you tested it in from much of this on? Biggest site. I, this is this still was not constructed on site, but what we did, we did a study for research uh, for a solar solution, and we built also a power management system for them. They have the diesel generator, I guess, and the PV, but not the battery units. So this is still was not tested on site, but the as we can as as we know that the, this diesel generation, uh, PV and the battery they are oversized. What are you guys powering at this site? What do you mean powering? Like it was a micro base, so what is um what's the load at this site? Uh it's around 0.4 megawatt. And is and it purely this... a test site or is it um what is the load actually? This these loads, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I think its peak is around 0.5 megawatt. On average, it's 0.4. And these battery energy storage can provide this VECs are rated 
at 0.6 in VA. And if you have the diesel generation along with it, you have two diesel generators. One can provide you 0.5 megawatt and the other 1.8. So everything is oversized and such. And I guess the rating of these battery energy storage system and PV was done by Roshani using Homer software. Okay, very cool, thank you. Yeah, I have a, a question. I think it's on slide 15 uh, from what I remember. Yeah, it is here. Uh, it was the one with the plots um, where you showed the plots of, uh, you know, maybe it's further ahead. Yeah, these ones here. So if you go to back to the previous slide, uh, slide 16, I believe. Yeah, if we could zoom into this a bit, I just want to see. Yeah, you mentioned, okay, so when the irradiance goes to 800, right? Okay, yeah, it was that next slide, I think. Next slide. Yeah, this one. When the irradiance goes to 800, uh, it ramps up and then the battery ramps down to account for that, right? So now it's primarily being, now the battery is getting charged by the solar. So, oh, okay, so why, okay, the PV gets ramped down, but you said, mentioned that it was because now it's following the MPPT reference. Uh, here, uh, is, here is in this scenario, okay. the supervisory control anticipates that overcharge is going to happen. Oh, so it provides it with a reference in order to discharge the battery at a very low power. I see, I see. So at that point, like right before 20 seconds is basically the battery is at full state of charge. So there's no yeah. reason to charge it. So it ramps it down. Yes. I see. Okay. And then the next question is, I'm not sure, did you say that these, these uh, battery and solar can both be in that grid forming mode? Is that, or is it? Yes. Yes, here, if, if we looked here, because no, okay. if you have a sunny day and these PVVCs is very like oversized. So what, what, what we suggested is that if you like loses everything and you only end up with the battery and the PV, here, if you operate them on a joint grid forming in a droop mode, as the battery trips here, uh, as, as the battery trips here, the PV can take over the a voltage volt like a grid forming tax for a while until you turn on your diesel. Okay. So, so at that time they're both grid forming. How, how do are they? How do you stop them from fighting each other? Like the battery and the PV, because now both of them are trying to set the voltage and the frequency at that at say your at your POI right at the load bus i guess right the poi bus do they fight each other or is it how does it work they won't fight each each other because okay. the frequency is controlled in an, an op open loop manner okay. and there is a droop control for that for example if we go if we go if we if we come here we can see that this oscillator control structure it is, is applied on both the pv and the battery so what's 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 gonna do is that it's gonna share the reactive power uh, equally between the PV and the battery, and for each for e for each uh, for each VEC, or I guess I have one secondary controller for the both VECs in order to install the nominal voltage of the frequency. So looking at the results, if these things are tuned properly. Prior to that here, we can see that there is an equal sharing of the reactive power between the PV and the battery, which is because you are adjusting the frequency like a, like a, as a droop mode as you have in diesel generators. So you share the reactive power here. I see. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Um, thank you. Um, did you find it uh, hard to tune them to get them stable? No, not really. Okay. 
because these are just a droop curve. And if you have your, for example, these are droop curves. And if you have just your uh, outer voltage control loops and inner current control loops properly tuned, which is almost the case, you won't have any issues. But this secondary controller, it has to be very slow because if this secondary control is very fast, it's going to override what the droop control is doing. Yeah. So you need. Uh, we got a question in the chat from Scott Henderson. Um, could the joint grid forming control be extended to include the diesel gen sets at the same time as the PV and battery energy storage? That's very interesting, actually. I haven't tried that, but I will try to do so. Yeah, that's very interesting. I haven't tried to include the gen set into the droop mode as that with the PV and battery actually. And because they are kind of have two different two different uh, droop curves, because for the diesel gen set, you have uh, P with the omega and Q with V, which is typical conventional droop curves, because that's the nature of the diesel generators. But here, you are mainly, uh, here VACs is going to be mainly influenced by the nature of the grid. Yeah, but th that would be interesting to try to spread them all together. I haven't tried that. Okay, we have another question from Teja. Have you tested the have you tested with the conventional droop uh, P I, I, I did actually Q V characteristics? I did. And in this case, it's not gonna work out because you have a, a resistive microgrid. For resistive microgrids, for resistive microgrids, as you change the power, the voltage is gonna change, the voltage is gonna change. Whereas, where for the frequency is going to be more mainly influenced by the reactive power. But if you have, if I have an inductive or a high voltage microgrid, then yeah, the conventional droop curve is going to work out. And this also, you, you, if you want to do your research, this is going to be made. I can provide you with a reference, but this is basically if you looked how the power flow happens in into resistive microgrids, you will have two different equations. And you have a paper written on this too, right, Moat? I do, yes. Okay. Yeah, maybe after if you could you know, post a link to it that we can use that as a reference to. Yeah, sure. I can I can send it to you and you can perhaps upload it or send it to the guest. Right, sure. Thank you. Does anyone have any more questions? Yeah. Feel free to write it in the chat or, you know, unmute yourself and ask. No worries. OK, I guess I have one more question here. Um, so you're you said you have a RTBS uh, set up. Could you kind of talk about uh, more of how you set up this real time simulator and like, you know, the test bed and what you tested? Actually, it's it's not a part of this research because this was done as a just transient simulation inside the RTDS. But the main point, the main, the main like objective of my whole research in my masters was to connect the uh, connect the RTDS with a power management system. So if you go to the test system setup, 
what I what I have in my thesis is a battery energy storage system and a PV and two diesel generators. For for which are interfaced with an RTAC and RTAC which have my power management system uh, uh, con control. The way I did it is that for actually we did not use any amplifi amplifiers. We actually exported the analog signals from the RTDS to the RTAC using goose messages and goose messages to control the PV and the battery energy storage system. So the signals that I need from my power management system is a reference powers for the battery energy storage system and the PV. And grid forming perhaps a control signal. It's not, it's not like a part of this topic or this this system setup. OK, so everything was modeled in R scale. Yeah, RSK. yeah, yeah, this in this in, for this paper, yes. OK, OK, I see. And the ex, the hardware was the R tech you mentioned that's sending the signals to the battery. That's OK. Yes, that's that's the power management system that I had was an R tech. Yeah. Oh, I see. OK. OK, yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, you're welcome. All right, does anyone have any more questions? Um, before we we plan to do like kind of a, a networking session after this where we go into breakout rooms of like five or so people each and kind of either discuss what we the great uh, webinar done by Moat or, you know, just kind of get to know each other a bit better. Um, so yeah, any last questions before we do that? Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Okay, so I guess not. Um, let me see. Let me first stop the recording here. <laughs>